Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle, medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Dad's podcast. We're we're on and again with a round two with uh, Dr. <laughs> Judson, and yeah, he's got his boxing gloves up. I pity the fool. <laughs> <laughs> we we had so much fun on the first one, and I learned a ton. And so to hear some of his intro and all the crazy things that he's got up to to bring him up into this moment, you, you got to tune in the first one because there's a ton of nuggets in there. So, Doctor Doctor Judson, thank you so much for being with us again today. On oh the man, I'm I'm very honored to be back for the the second round. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, he just just to quickly, you know, he's a doctor dad as well. He's in private practice now, and he's in California, and he's about to share his results uh, with with uh, was it International Sexual Medicine Conference? Was that what it was? Yeah, it's the joint meeting of the International Society of Sexual Medicine and the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. So you would think like this would be like the coolest conference, <laughs> like you know, like be like going to the Playboy Mansion. But you know, <laughs> to be honest, it's just like a bunch of like older men and women walking around in blue and gray suits putting up data and talking about like with like a really straight face presenting data on like penis size and orgasm and curved penis and all these crazy stuff that we deal with, but in such like a boring statistical way that uh, I was a little disappointed. Fun out of it, right? Yeah. And really sucks the fun out of it. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> and we're going to be in Miami over Halloween. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. I almost it, picture you showing up in a crazy costume. Yeah. Presenting your data. Yeah. That would be kind of fun. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> it wouldn't go over very well, but it would be kind of fun. <laughs> so that was a mouthful to say yeah. the, the name of the conference, but you're yeah. presenting at this amazing conference that, that's held. Was it once a year, did you say? Once a year. Yeah. Once a year. So uh, tell walk us through this because it's called the... Uh, yeah, walk us through it. I'm not yeah, gonna... it's uh, the the International Society. It's usually like the Sexual Medicine Society of North America has their own meeting. And then every two years, there's an international meeting. But because of COVID, the meeting got canceled in Japan. So everyone's meeting in uh, in Miami. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, these are the guys that invented Viagra. These are the guys that invented penile implants and, and fixed, you know, things for Peyronie's disease and all sorts of... of uh, you know, amazing discoveries to improve uh, erectile function. So, yeah, talk about your study, though. Will it tell us? Let's let's walk us yeah, through your, so, your data okay. and, and, every, right. and the whole study design. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as a disclaimer, uh, I could care less how long guys' penises are. Okay, but fifty percent of guys or more actually really care how long their penises are, and most of them, in fact, I've never met someone who thought their penis was too long. So I'll, I would say all of them feel like their penis is too short. And this, you know, this isn't just guys whose penises are too short, you know, that it, there are guys with normal penises that would like them bigger. There are guys with large penises that would like them bigger. And there are guys with small penises that want them bigger. And so, but some people actually take action and they get fillers, they get um, uh, traction devices, they get fat transfers, they get um, suspensory ligament ligations. And now there's even a silicone implant like a breast implant but for the penis and i've wow. seen that those people that have those things when they have problems or disasters they come to see people like me and so you know if you get filler injected in the penis first of all it's expensive it's about five or ten thousand bucks second of all it only lasts for a year or two and third of all you get a lumpy bumpy penis okay if you get fat transfer you get this kind of squishy penis which you know just um it almost looks like a pig in a blanket. Um, if you the get visuals uh, are so helpful, by the way, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you get your suspensory ligament cut, that's the ligament that hangs kind of the penis. Uh, then it doesn't increase your length, but you hang lower in the in the shower. But when you get an erection, it points down, uh, and and then as it scars your penis kind of pulls up. So that's really a disaster. I've seen some really, really bad outcomes from them. 
there's a, an implant called the Penuma. So you got to pay 20,000 bucks or 15,000 bucks to get basically a silicone taco put over your penis under the skin. Um, and I've seen a number of them taken out. Uh, there was a recent report at the uh, American Urologic Association by one of my colleagues on uh, a dozen of those that he had taken out. So it it's not like the breast. It does, there's not really a space to put a good implant. And so uh, I was kind of discouraged by that. And so I wanted to solve the problem for guys. And so I, I work a lot with PRP or platelet-rich plasma. Uh, and PRP, basically platelets in the body have two functions. One function is to stop bleeding. And the second function is to start the healing process, right? So it's kind of a beautiful system. When you injure yourself, the platelets go, they stop the bleeding, but then they release the growth factors, which causes healing. It causes the regrowth of tissue. And so I thought, well, maybe we can use that and a traction device that a friend of mine developed at the Mayo Clinic that we use for Peyronie's disease. And it's been shown to increase length about almost an inch uh, if you use it properly. And a suction device, which will increase the girth of the penis, right? Because you want to increase the length, right? But if, if you just increase the length, then you have a pencil penis. Uh, and if you want to increase the girth, but if you just increase the girth, then you have a pig in a blanket penis. So what you want is symmetrical length and girth and then we add our Affirm nitric oxide boosting supplement to boost the circulation, to improve erections and improve nighttime erections, right? So I put this kind of whole thing together and I submitted it as a protocol, got institutional review board approval um, because, you know, you shouldn't experiment without oversight of, uh, of um, and I, you know, I've done research at American Red Cross. I've done research at Harvard Medical School. I've done research at UCLA. So I have some experience and credentials uh, doing research. And, uh, and we were listed by clinicaltrials.gov, which is the NIH clinical trials website. And we fought through COVID. Uh, re patient recruitment was quite a uh, interesting story. I'll, I can go into uh, it a little bit later. And uh, lo and behold, at the end of about two years, we had 18 patients that we could present for uh, no, 16 patients that we could present for an abstract to the ISSM. Uh, and we have a total of 32 that will finish the study. And uh, if you want to add a drum roll, we increase length 0.85 inches and we increase girth 0.47 inches. And everyone in the study remarked that they had improved erectile function. That, that's awesome. I mean, uh, you're, you're pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it takes six cool. months. It, it yeah. involves some work and stretching and traction. So about 40 minutes in the morning, 40 minutes in the evening, but it's totally natural. There are no side effects. The penis doesn't look funny. There's, we're not, there's no fillers. It's doable. If you want to put the time into it, if that's something that's important to you, um, it doesn't preclude any other augmentation procedures. If you want to go that way, uh, and it costs a whole lot less than um, than similar procedures or technologies um, that that are currently existing. So if anyone out there is interested, just go to p-long.com. So p-long.com. And, uh, and there's a ton of information. I made a bunch of videos. And we're assembling now a, a team of doctors uh, nationally and internationally to provide the service for folks. Um, and that's my story. That's, so that's on a, Friday, I get story. to present in front of my, uh, my blue suit and gray suit colleagues. <laughs> and I'm sure they'll, they'll, uh, challenge me and tear me to pieces, which we all do to each other. But, but anyway, that's, it's, that's the fun stuff going on in my life. That's amazing. David, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious. So you said this is like about a six month process. Right. So you get the injections, right? How many injections are there over this? Experience? Yeah, it's once a month for six months. And then and how it's, often are they pumping? Uh, every day. Every so, day. Okay. Yeah, so traction 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, and pumping about 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening. Doesn't sound like the worst thing to get to do every day. I mean, twice no, a day? No, I mean, it's, it, yeah. I, I wanted to do it, you know, so there's a lot of anecdotal information out there that if you put a traction device on 
for eight to 10 hours a day for six to eight months, you can increase the, the length of the penis, right? But most people with normal jobs can't do that. That's I mean, if you look at, commitment. yeah, it's a huge time. I mean, if you look at National Geographic magazine, you see those African tribes where they put those rings around people's necks and they have these like giraffe life necks. I mean, biological systems are pliable by nature if you apply the proper pressure in the proper way for a long enough period of time, right? But I wanted to provide something for men that wasn't eight to 10 hours a day. You know, if you want to do this, if this is important to you, and I'm not saying that it should be important to you, I'm saying if it's important to you, there's a way to increase the length and girth of the penis safely and function. That's the other thing is we asked all of our patients, you know, is it the same? Is it better? Is it much better? Is it worse? Is it much worse? Because the thing is, all of these guys, by definition, had normal, healthy erections. So we don't really have a, a scale to assess function and improvement in function when things are already working normally. But, you know, all of us as guys know when things are working better than they were working before. So mm -hmm. and it's an area that's not often talked about. I mean, in, in quiet it is, you know, you might talk to your GP, like I'm having erectile dysfunction issues. It's, it's a very like uncomfortable subject to bring up, mm -hmm. uh, but to see that even in healthy functioning humans, uh, men, you're actually having an increased uh, experience of performance as well. And is that expected to be something that they would, the effects are going to linger, you know, or is there, is there a possible possibility that might regress after a period of time? You know, it's like going to the orthodontist, right? Your teeth don't move back to where they used to go. Yeah, I right. think as long as you're having healthy erections, there's no reason why the penis will not, you know, will go back to the size that it used to used to be, um, you know, because you're, you're stretching out the, the collagen and elastin, you're realigning it. Now, yeah. as you age, right? So th this is a study in healthy guys with normal erectile function. When you talk about guys with erectile dysfunction, that's a whole different story. Those guys are experiencing penile shortening as they lose their nighttime erections and they lose their daytime erections. The, the collagen and elastin of the penis, which is really tough tissue, doesn't stretch to the same level that it used to stretch. And so all my guys in their late 60s, 70s, 80s are telling me that they've lost a half an inch, an inch, two inches, 12 inches on their, on their penile length that they had a long time ago. Hmm. That's I was just getting about the 12 inches. I was going to say like, you, you must have some interesting men that come into your, I have interesting <laughs> conversations. Absolutely. Can't, can't, um, pitch, can't pitch a tent as good as I used to. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's, I mean, this is, this is exciting news because when you, when you listed off all of those other strategies, again, for those people that are interested, none of those sound very Good. Uh, I mean, they like the the lumpy penis, the the pig in the blanket, all you know, cutting the the ligaments. Uh, I mean, all those sound like really sh possibly maybe a short term benefit for the long term trauma afterwards. But you know, the thing is, it's not worth it. Guys, do it. Right. <laughs> right. As as crazy as it sounds, as uncomfortable as it sounds, as unnatural as it sounds, you know, there's something kind of a little loco in guys brains mm -hmm. that tell us to do these things. Uh, and so if you're going to do it, it's like a parent that says, Oh, you know, if my kid's going to drink, I'd rather have them do it at my house. I could at least keep them safe. Right. So, you know, if you're going to, if you're, if you really want a longer penis, the P long study and the P long protocol is the way to go to get gains of length and girth and function in a way that's totally safe, mm -hmm. right? That if it's done properly, shouldn't be any complications. And the other nice thing is when we start publishing the graphs, it's a linear growth curve. So at the end of six months, we had to stop the study, not stop the study, but you know, I mean, it can't go on forever. Uh, and so, you know, we had good enough results that we could publish, but there's no reason to believe that going forward, if you kept going, you wouldn't get better length and girth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we've seen in a number of our patients that are, we had people fly in from all over the place, but, you know, our local patients um, have continued to come in for uh, PRP injections once a month and, uh, and, and stretch and, and they've continued to get gains. 
So are these people buying the the de devices to use at home or how does that work? And then Yeah, so that you know they purchase the devices. So on p-long.com we sell the the traction device, the suction device and the supplements. Uh, and then we refer you to a certified provider who uh, will provide the the PRP injections and is familiar with the protocol and you know we yeah. teach you how to use the 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 traction device and the suction device, but sometimes you need a a holding, you know, a, a hand, your hand held a little bit. For sure. And then, so with the injections, I mean, getting a needle anywhere near my nether regions feels like something I, I, I wouldn't sign up for, but to talk about that process a little bit for men. Yeah. You discomfort. know, so um, I developed an ultrasound guided um, injection of PRP in the penis. So first of all, on the shaft of the penis, you don't have a lot of nerves. Most of the nerves are, are sequestered towards the, the head of the penis, especially at the frenulum. So if you don't stick a needle in that location, uh, you're probably more than okay. Uh, and second of all, I have a, a special technique with a really, really tiny needle, a 30 gauge needle, where we introduce it, we use ultrasound to exactly localize where it's supposed to be. And then injecting the actual platelets or the PRP into the penis, you know, the penis is basically a potential vascular space. So once the needle is in place, you don't feel anything. Right. And so it's going you, into the cavernosa, you said, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we do, you know, an injection on either side of the cavernosa. And it, to be perfectly honest, I mean, I've done this to myself three or four times. Uh, so I know how it feels. Uh, I do it to my patients all the time. And 99 times out of 100, my patients say uh, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Cool. And are you using a numbing cream at all with the injection? And I do this on like big guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, like there's I was, sometimes the ones I was listening the most to a pod needles. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast on like this guy that tracked lions through Africa. And everyone's like, oh, you got to be so brave to do that. And I'm thinking like, I'm sticking a little needle in a guy's penis and he's about 300 pounds and really muscular. And I'm, I'm the bravest guy, not the guy that's sticking, <laughs> that's following lions. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, I mean, it sounds, it's not, I mean, I, I'm, I love that you're doing this work and especially giving men a different solution. And the fact that you're actually training other dogs too. I mean, I, it's, it's important. This message gets out there for men that there, there are options and, and it does like, I couldn't talk about this without also talking about the mental emotional side of things. You know, you know, why is it the men aren't feeling okay in their bodies? Right. What, what is, what is that sort of a, a emotional draw? You know, I think that unfortunately we do live in a culture where, you know, we keep getting the message. We're not enough the way that we, we are. And so, you know, unfortunately there are there's always going to be a draw to try to improve ourselves. And, and, you know, that may not solve that, that problem that's happening internally with, with regards to how do we, how we feel, but, you know, at least it's providing a really safe and effective solution. Right. Yeah. I mean, the thing is there's this thing called body dysmorphism, right. Which basically is a fancy way of saying like, you're just not happy with the way you look. Right. And, and so I, you know, I talk to, and part of my training is to talk to my, the doctors that I'm training about body dysmorphism and, and to, to uh, kind of assess your patients. Cause the thing is, you don't want to, you don't want to start someone down the road of a person who's never going to be happy. Right. And that was the really important part of, yeah. you know, we kind of had an inkling that doing this um, would result in improvement and you know, I'm not the first person in the world that kind of came up with this concept. There was an abstract from 2017 out of India that from a guy that had done something somewhat similar. But the thing is, what I wanted to set were proper expectations, right? If you do the following four things with the equipment, exactly the same equipment that I'm using, right? So there's single spin PRP and there's double spin PRP. There's 20 cc's of PRP and there's 60 cc blood draw. So I use the, the highest concentration of PRP. So 60 cc's in a double spin system, right? And the, the traction device from Pathright Medical, the RestoreX and the Dr. Joel Kaplan pump and the Affirm but you don't expect to get the same results if you don't use the same equipment. But if you use the same equipment, these are the results that you can reasonably expect, right? So you don't go in there saying, well, I'm going to double the size of my penis, right? Then you're going to be disappointed. I wanted to figure out exactly what 
the expectations should be so that, okay, if you do everything that I'm telling you to do, these are the reasonable expectations from what you can expect. And, you know, don't be disappointed that, you know, your penis isn't 12 inches because I didn't tell you that it was going to be that, you know, if you started with six, you might get to 6.8 or maybe get to seven. And, and, you know, that's good enough. And if you want to go for more, then you have to do more treatment. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so I, I'd love to talk, to pick your brain on some other topics as well. Um, and so before we transition into another topic, just one more time, the website, and again, we'll put it in the show notes, but I'm sure oh, yeah. people are going to want so to check it out. It's p-long.com. .com. Awesome. Okay. So we can't talk about men's health without talking about the aging man. And one of the most important things that you shared last time too, in the aging man is muscle development, muscle growth. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about this and why you feel like this is such an important area to, to address for men. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's, you know, I, I just like an hour ago finished up with a guy and, and we had this exact conversation because a lot of men, when they hit their seventies, they put weight on up top and their legs are weak, right? Nobody likes working out legs. Everyone hates leg day, Right. Everyone loves biceps, triceps, you know, chest, you know, those are the beach muscles, right? You know, your chicks are checking out your, your biceps and, and triceps and, and pecs. But at the end of the day, after you turn 60, what really matters is core and leg strength, right? What's going to get you is your back or your loss of mobility because of your legs, right? No one cares if you fall and you break your shoulder or you fall and you break your arm. They, call, they care if you fall and you break your hip yeah. or you need a knee replacement, right? And that's where you have to refocus uh, your attention, you know? And what I recommend for my, the guys is ABC, right? A stands for ambulate. So walk, run, elliptical, stairmaster, treadmill, something where you're, on your two feet. And then the second day is B for bike, right? Get on a, you know, exercise bike or a road bike or, you know, a mountain bike. And then C is circuit training, right? So you need some resistance training. And then you rotate that because as you get older, you need two days to recover. So I have my 16 year old son will go out and play basketball for half an hour, an hour. And he's like having a great time. I'm having a great time. The next day, He's like, dad, that was so much fun. Let's go play basketball again. And I can barely get off the couch. <laughs> right. So, you know, I need two full days to recover from, uh, you know, a good workout. And so that's why you want to rotate what you're doing. All those people that were on the Peloton during the, the pandemic, they didn't build any muscle. They got some good cardiovascular fitness and they burn calories, but you need to rest muscle in order for it to build. Because when you're exercising, you're actually tearing down, causing micro tears of the muscle. And then you need sleep because sleep is when you rebuild muscle. You need protein, right? You can't build muscle. So as you get older, the things you can't build muscle without. If your testosterone level sucks, you will not build muscle. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many hours a day you work out, you will not build muscle. If you're not eating enough protein, you will not build muscle, right? Muscle is made out of protein. So if you're not eating protein, you know, you can eat all the ice cream cones and drink, you know, and, and bread and all that you want, but you're not going to build muscle. Muscle's built out of protein, right? If you don't take uh, supplements like creatine to regenerate ATP and a firm nitric oxide booster to improve circulation, because even if you have testosterone, even if you have protein, if you can't deliver it to the place where you're building muscle, then it's, it's kind of irrelevant. So, you know, these are the things that I talk to my patients about uh, in terms of helping them build muscle, right? Because we, I, I don't know that much about nutrition and fat loss, um, I know enough to be sort of functional, but we don't talk about weight loss in my office. We talk about body composition. We talk about mm -hmm. muscle and we talk about fat. 
Love it. Yeah. I love that you I love that you focused on that rest piece because you know a lot of people they go through life with this idea of like more is better, right? And they're just constantly grinding it in the gym, thinking, oh, this is how I'm gonna get there, and they're just working against themselves the whole time. Yeah. You know, and I'm still learning all the time. So um I'm introducing a new service in my office, which is VO2 max testing, which I'm really, really, really jazzed about. I just made a, a video of my VO2 max test. And, um, and I found like my VO2 max was really good. It was 45, which is really good for my age. I was really pumped about that. But I learned that most of the time I'm exercising in zone three and the different zones are based on heart rates. And I'm not an expert at this. Um, I just learned really about it the other day from the the CEO of this company. Um, but you know, I, I'm like every busy dad, you know, I want to work out. So I got in, I get on my bike or my treadmill or whatever, and I just grind as hard as I can for 30, 40 minutes. And I'm in zone three, maybe zone four, but that I'm learning. I don't know for sure is probably not the right way to do it. If you want to burn, if you want to teach your body how to burn fat, you're supposed to do it in zone two and then do high intensity interval training in zone five. Maybe you guys more know, know more about that kind of stuff than I do, but that that's my, my next task of learning is mm -hmm. understanding how to, that was the one thing that I had to improve was burning more fat and less sugar or carbohydrates. Yeah, I would say I would say from from what I've seen too, just the studies on even growth hormone and testosterone release, it's the the adaptive response, the short burst, and then the recovery, the short burst and the recovery versus sustained activity in in your, you know, seventy five percent or whatever that would be of your maximal heart rate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's what I've seen. Uh, even from like a, I mean, there's some interesting studies even on telomere length and um, and the type of training that we do, and it turns out that that uh, weightlifting, lifting weights, or or doing some of the high intensity and real training turned out to be more beneficial than than say marathon running, mm -hmm. which can expedite you know that that loss. Oh David, yeah, well I mean yeah, the thing uh, is, good. yeah, I mean it's it's a zero sum game. Yeah. So if you're training for a marathon and you're not boosting with a lot of testosterone and you're not eating a huge amount of protein, your body's going to say, "Listen, I don't need arms." Because all I'm doing is running all day. So your body's going to take muscle from the arms and put it into the leg running muscles. That's why it's important as you age to be much more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. Definitely. David, have you seen anything on that? Like uh, on the, the recovery and, and using um, the different styles of training and intensity levels? I know for the hit as far as fat burning that's kind of where you want to be at but again you know it's this dance like you guys are talking about between the right type of exercise and the recovery i mean you could be doing the right type of exercises but then you're not resting adequately yeah. or you know one of the big things i talk to a lot of people about is you know most people plan their week out of what they're going to do in the gym right and so they already have an idea oh, i'm going to do this class this day i'm going to do this type of workout this day but the reality there is if you're not recovering from maybe the couple of days before let's say you planned on doing a hit workout on Thursday, but you're just not, you know, you're not recovered. It's not a good idea to do it that day. So I always tell people like, you don't do hit exercise when you don't have much in the tank and you feel tired that day, because then it's not going to be beneficial for you. So even the timing of when you should be doing those things actually plays this massive role in whether you're going to get the benefit. So it kind of goes beyond just, okay, I know I need to do this type of exercise. I need this adequate amount of rest. The timing is the other big piece that a lot of people are missing, I think. So that, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's the biggest piece I would probably add to that. Yeah, you know, I think, if, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a balance between motivation and timing. Because um, sometimes yeah. people say, well, you know, maybe it's just because I'm not really motivated to work out and that's why I'm not working out. Or, you know, in, in our situation as, you know, as busy fathers, it's like I got 40 minutes or 30 minutes and that's it. You know, if I don't, if I don't fit into that slot, I'm going to lose that, that opportunity for a day or two days or three days or who knows. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I find for myself, even just my work schedule, if I don't do my morning routine, it's, it's really hard to do something at like, after I put the kids to bed at like seven 30, eight o'clock at night, like it's not going to happen. 
right? By the time I get yeah. through my patient day and get home and have dinner or whatever it is. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, that's my advice to, to dads in general. And I do yeah. a ton of vasectomy. So I see a lot of, uh, you know, young dads is you just got to do it in the morning. You got to train yourself to wake up before everyone else, which is really, really hard, especially if you're not a morning person, but that's it. You know, when you get home, you're going to get pulled in 72 different directions. And at the end of the day, you know, every age is different. They're doing different things. You're going to feel like you're missing out of something. If you're off in the gym for an hour and the kids are doing their homework and you could be doing their homework with them, or you could be doing X, Y, and Z with them. Totally. Love it. Well, let's, uh, let's shift gears into TRT. I would love uh, for this episode to be something where people can really come back to and really understand when is the right time for testosterone replacement therapy? What do I need to look for? What, you know, do you prefer uh, Dutch testing or blood or, you know, let's, let's dive in. Where, where do you want to start? Yeah. On, so on that? first of all, if you, I wrote three really, really good eBooks that are totally oh, nice. free. So if you go to my website, brandicemd.com, and then go to the media tab and drop down to eBooks, you can just download the eBooks. One is all about testosterone, which is kind of like the basic one. The second one is called levels, right? Testosterone levels, right? Because you can't just take testosterone as a pill because your liver, once it gets into the bloodstream, your liver will break it down. And so they are different. You can either have a surface preparation or you can have uh, an injectable preparation, whether it's pellets or shots or whatever. And the levels between those two are dramatically different. And so they're, you know, don't think that all testosterone replacement is, is the same. And so when you're considering that, go to that levels book. And the thing is, like, I don't necessarily want to spend my time writing these eBooks, but when I go to the literature and there's just nothing out there, then I'm like, well, I guess I got to write it right? Because I do it for my own information and for my patients. And then I just sort of put it out there for it. And then the last one is I was seeing a lot of guys who were taking performance enhancing drugs for bodybuilding and, and athletics and so on and so forth. And so I wrote a really, really good ebook on understanding performance enhancing drugs, because I saw a bunch of guys who really messed themselves up for life using kind of bro science. Yeah. And I want to thank, there's a guy out there, Big Mike, right? I asked my patient, where do you get this stuff? And where do you get your information from? And he's like, Big Mike. So I said, Just Google, Big know, Mike. Google Big Mike, or you can <laughs> Google Dr. Brandeis and uh, I, I will provide you the information because Big Mike was uh, really messed some people up. <laughs> okay. So testosterone is the most important growth hormone for men. It's what makes us men, right? It's, you know, when we're developing in utero, it what, it's what determines, you know, we, at the first couple of weeks of life, we have both the female and male parts. And then if you have testosterone and malarian inhibition factor, you become a male. Otherwise, the female is sort of the default mode. Okay. And so it's important there. And then we're 12 years old. Our testosterone is like 200. We're these little scrawny kids. And then you know, five years later, our testosterone's a thousand, you know, we've grown a foot, we put on muscle, our penis grows, we put on body hair, our voice gets lower, we're chasing girls around. Um, and it's because our testosterone levels go up five times, right? And at the age of 20, your testosterone should be ballpark a thousand, and it goes down one or 2% per year after that. So as opposed to women where they go through menopause and it drops precipitously, with men, it, it slowly declines over time. That's awesome. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting that we all kind of start out as women. Is that what you're saying? And then, and then, well, we, we, of... we, we all start out as both. Both. Gotcha. And then, uh, and then you either you grow the male parts or you hit the default mode. So, like, um, sorry to pick on Jamie Lee Curtis, but she's an XY. Uh, but right. her, she doesn't have, I think, the proper uh, receptors for testosterone. And so you develop as a female because you don't have the proper testosterone receptors. Right. And there's a whole field of sort of intersects about those kind of things. But that's too complicated to get into. Totally. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so men, it's important for them to know that testosterone is going to decline by one to 2% per year after the age 20, 25 or so, like you said, now that can be expedited in the world that we live in with like crappy nutrition, not exercising, maybe people are smoking, maybe there's medications. So one to 2% might be kind of the norm oh yeah potential but i mean we see people all the time they're they're crashed at, they're crashed at 25 absolutely right? well the yeah. thing is so your body is smart right your body will only produce what it needs right so if you're a hunter and you're out on the plane like taking down wild boar right you need high testosterone because wild boar are kind of nasty and they don't like being killed if you're a farmer farmers work really hard but they don't kill wild boar. Uh, and so your testosterone still has to be high, but it doesn't have to be super high. Now, if you sit behind a computer all day, your testosterone doesn't have to be that high. So your body says, well, I, you know, I like, I don't need testosterone more than four or 500 to do this job. And so that's all I'm going to make. Why should I spend energy producing something I don't need? Right. And then our nutrition's lousy. We're, you know, we have there's pesticides and plastics and all sorts of crap in our food, um, and we, you know, we sit with laptops in our in our lap um, and that produce heat, which is really adverse to testicular function. That's why our testicles sit outside of our body, right? We don't want to have something hot on our scrotum, um, but people do all the time, and so all these things contribute to a loss of testosterone. The other thing is that people don't sleep, right? If you look at the circadian rhythm of testosterone, when is it highest? Eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. When is it lowest? Eight o'clock at night. When is it highest? Eight o'clock in the morning, right? So you make testosterone, you use it up during the day. And then when you sleep, you recharge it. But if you don't sleep well, or if you don't sleep enough, you're not going to recharge your testosterone. So these are all kind of basic things that you can do that sort of help health across the board, right? So working out hard, getting good sleep, eating better, you know, eating foods that aren't processed and don't have pesticides and don't have plastics in them. I mean, that's, that's just kind of good all around, but certainly good for testosterone production. Awesome. David, go ahead. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing how he's talking about this environmental influence on your, your production. Is there any studies, Doc, that show, you know, I, I think I heard something, I want to say I saw it in a movie where I heard it, but where he says when there's like a competing male that steps into the environment, another male's testosterone levels can raise over kind of like this competition type thing over females. Is there any studies that show something like oh, that? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I was working out this morning watching, I love watching nature videos, right? And there are these like rams that live on the side of the mountain in Alaska and they're just like slamming into each other, headbutting each other. And it's just brutal. And, the, you know, the, the brand with the biggest balls is going to win. Yeah. You know, I've, I was in Africa a long time ago and I watched a zebra with a pregnant zebra. I don't know what a pregnant zebra, you know, a female zebra is called. But, but I saw him fight off other males for literally four to five hours hours oh wow right you know like guys is you know it's different you know you flex your muscles you get into your fancy car you drive away or whatever but you know animals on the plane every day they're fighting each other for hours and hours for the right to reproduce and breed that's exhausting so how yeah, can we so, don't do I mean, that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just battle it out all the time. Yeah. To protect I mean, your woman. That's evolution. Yeah. I have another question, follow up to that. Because you mentioned you do a lot of vasectomies. Any issues with testosterone post vasectomy? No. Testosterone just affects the, the delivery of sperm. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So, because I was looking at some studies the other day, trying to see, and those studies are basically saying there's not much of a shift there after you have a vasectomy. Mm -hmm. Those things aren't yeah. okay. Very good. Yeah. So, so men, do you have a preference for men on pellets, cream, or injections, or does yeah. it just is it all individual? Okay. So, so I'm going to fly a little bit in the face of the American Urologic Association recommendations, which 
tell people that they should get into what's called the eugonadal range, right? So when you look at your testosterone comes back and it says normal is between 300 and 900, right? So you want to be around common sense says, oh, I want to be around five or 600, right? And so for years and years, I was trying to get my patients to that level. And you can use creams for that. You can use patches. You can use, uh, there's a sublingual, you can, there's an intranasal, Okay, but what I've learned over the past three years is that's just BS, right? My guys do best when their testosterones are between 1,000 and 1,200. Mm-hmm. And that's what I go for is a slightly super physiologic level, right? When you're 20, your testosterone's 1,000 and you feel great, right? So why would I settle for a testosterone of 500 to feel like a 60-year-old when I could feel like a 20-year-old? And my guys are just, they're, they're just happy, you know? They, they're building muscle. They're losing fat. Their libido is great. They sleep better. Their aches and pains go away. They're motivated. They're, they're driven. Um, you know, it's like a sunny day every day, pretty much. And it, you know, the thing is, it's like, you look at me and you're like, oh, really? But you know, the thing is, it's not a drug. It's a natural hormone. Yeah. Right. So any guy with a bat and two balls is going to do great on testosterone. That's just the way it is. You know, that's just human biology. It's not like you're taking a medication where, you know, a small percentage of people are going to have unknown side effects. We know what the side effects are, right? So aside from the beneficial effects, um, you're going to, your face is going to get a little oily if you're predisposed to that, right? If you got a lot of acne when you were a kid, you're probably going to get some acne. You're going to lose some hair on your head if you're predisposed to that because testosterone gets converted into dihydrotestosterone and DHT works on the hair follicles in in the hair. That's why you take something like Propecia. Uh, And there are a bunch of things you can do to prevent hair loss like near infrared light helmets, uh, oral minoxidil, uh, taking uh, Propecia, which blocks 5-alpha reductase, even PRP in the scalp can help with that. Um, there are some effects on the prostate when testosterone current turns into dihydrotestosterone. So over time, it can cause growth of the prostate. Now, it does not cause prostate cancer. Okay, so let be very, very clear. It doesn't cause prostate cancer. So it's safe to take in those kind of situations. You know, Doc, I have to quick story. My dad had a pituitary tumor about two, three years ago, and you had to go have it removed. And right after he had to be on hormone therapy for about, they had him on hormone therapy for about a year and and making sure they didn't lose his pituitary before they wanted to take him off. And they put him on testosterone. And it was interesting. I I remember when he was getting his labs and getting tested initially, when they gave it to him, he was up over a thousand. And I saw a different person Hmm. when he was there. Like my dad it's almost like the clock dialed back a good like 20 years for him. He had all this energy and you could see, just see the life in him. But over the year, the doctor kept wanting to drop it down. And he said, Oh, it's, it's, it's too high. We need you somewhere around like 600. So I'm going to start reducing the dose. So they started reducing the dose. And I watched over like this six month period slowly as they reduced that life just slowly diminished in my dad as they brought that down. And it was just this very interesting, you know, you're sitting back and you're just watching it from this observation and you're saying like, man, this is powerful stuff. And I love what you're, you're speaking to because literally when it was on that higher end, he was that different person. He was very, I mean, it's almost like he just got reinvigorated with life. Yeah. Um, and you know, like people ask, well, am I, you know, like I get these 65 year old guys are like, am I going to be like going into a bar and getting to a fight? <laughs> Right. I'm like, Melvin, you're 65. You're an accountant. You're not going to go to a country club and beat someone up. Right. You know, so all that comes from you're a football player, right? You're playing against other young guys whose testosterones are naturally a thousand. So in order to get an advantage over those guys, you got to get your testosterone up to 2000 or 2500, right? That's when you go into roid rage. You know, Melvin, the account, when his testosterone hits a thousand, 
is going to hit a golf ball further, but he's not going to hit, you know, Larry the lawyer. Yeah, it's funny because there's all these misconceptions of what testosterone does, Huge. you know. And Huge. it's it, there. There's tons of people that even, even come into my office. It's like taboo, right? Even I have a lot of women that have had the pellets done. And they, they'll tell me right away when they initially got them, they felt a lot better. But then they say, but I'm still feeling horrible kind of deal, right? And they've got other health things going on. But it's just interesting how there's this conventional wisdom around it as it's this yeah. negative thing when it's too high. When, when we all know that there's, these, there's massive benefits to having good levels of this stuff in our yeah. system. I mean, people really should read my free ebooks because it really, it, it breaks it down really, really awesome. clearly. What about, have you found anything to be effective for SHBG? Um, so in my supplement called support, there is mm -hmm. a, a compound called Tonkat Ali. Yeah. And Tonkat Ali will bind SHBG. And uh, so SHBG is sex hormone binding globulin. So uh, if you want, I can sort of explain what the purpose of sex hormone binding globulin is. Yeah, yeah let's do that. Yeah. So your testosterone makes about four to eight milligrams of testosterone every day, right? But unlike other glands in the body or hormones or endocrine glands, it doesn't store it. So if you think about like your liver, right? Your liver makes bile and bile is stored by the bile duct. And then when you eat a high fat meal, the bile duct squeezes and the bile goes into the, the intestines and it emulsifies the fats, right? But the rest of the time it's hanging out in the, in the gallbladder. The testicle is different. As the testicle makes testosterone, it's released into the bloodstream, right? But you need to kind of store it. You can't use all the testosterone at once. So the good Lord invented this thing called sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein that is attached to testosterone. So testosterone binds to SHBG and a huge percentage of testosterone binds to SHBG, like 98% plus or minus one or 1%. So you'll get a testosterone level of 500, but only 10 or 12 will actually be free testosterone that's available to bind. So think of it like a key, right? If it's free, it can open up a lock, but if it's stuck in a big glob of clay, it can't open up the lock. And that's why if you stop producing testosterone, you're still going to have some testosterone in the system for an extended period of time. Now, ideally, you would block more of the SHBG so that more of the testosterone would be free. And apparently... Tonkat Ali will bind some of the binding sites in SHBG so that you have a higher percentage of uh, free testosterone. Oh, that's so that's how it's working. It's basically interfering with the binding. Right, exactly. Yeah. So support has DHEA, which is a testosterone precursor. It's got DIM, which blocks the aromatization of testosterone, right? So we're all taught men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? But if you actually look at the molecule of testosterone and estrogen, the only difference between the two is a single hydrogen atom. Mm. So it's easy for your body to flip testosterone into estrogen. And a lot of that takes place in adipose tissue or fat tissue. That's what another reason why testosterone levels are going down is because 40% of men are obese. So they have a place where testosterone turns into estrogen, which is why guys that are heavy get these man boobs. Right, because they have higher levels of estrogen. And so uh, support the, the supplement that I make uh, has DIM in it. It's got Tonkat Ali, it's got ashwagandha, and then some zinc and magnesium, which help your body make testosterone. That's awesome. Um, and then I have another question is about the oral minoxidil. Like, do you, do you find there to be any problems with taking that stuff? Well, you know, it didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> it obviously worked for you. Right. I haven't tried it yet. I haven't tried it yeah, yet. Yeah. Minoxidil is just a weak blood pressure medication. There shouldn't really be any issues with taking it. Um, okay. You can take it topically on your hair, but apparently in recent studies, they've shown that taking it orally uh, works better. And basically the, the reason it works is it opens up or dilates blood vessels on your scalp, which feeds more blood circulation to the, the hair follicles and, and keeps the hair follicles more healthy. Oh, so it's, it's more to do with blood blood flow as opposed to blocking uh, the enzyme. Yeah. So the, um, 
Propecia or finasteride yeah. or dutasteride, that is an uh, enzyme blocker. Oh, okay. That works differently. Cool. Because, I, I mean, I've, I've seen some men who are on, say, finasteride, we might see some false elevations in testosterone where where we want to get that activity into DHT. Yeah. And so, you know, be really, really careful with the finasteride. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so you, a known you side a effect. for minoxidil then? I, w- I would. Yeah. You know, a known side effect of finasteride or that class of drugs is um, decreased libido. Yeah. Uh, and actually I started taking dutasteride years and years ago. And within six or eight weeks, I'm like, uh Oh, you know, I'd rather be a bald guy and have sex with my wife than, than, uh, than have hair and have no sex. You bet. And, um, but the other thing is, and I thought this was, was BS. I thought this was just a ploy to, to, to sue drug makers, but I have seen legitimate patients who come to my office with true erectile dysfunction from taking finasteride and dutasteride. Oh, wow. uh, and so, you know, it, it may be a one in a hundred, it may be a one in a thousand, maybe one in 10,000, but there's always one in that one in a thousand. And I have seen legitimate patients come in with true erectile dysfunction. It's really, really difficult to take care of. So if, if I was going to take something, I would take, um, I would take oral minoxidil. Yeah. And then, like you said, you use the infrared helmet or the near infrared light. Um, and you said PRP could be an option there. There are other options out there yeah. as well, obviously. Yeah. That's, that's great. Or a yarmulke. Doc, I know, I know we're coming close to the hour and I know you got to run to see patients. Uh, we always learn a ton having you on the, the podcast and I'm excited for you to be able to present to your colleagues. I look forward to hearing hearing how that goes. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. It was, it was, uh, I'll tell you real quick. Um, you know, it's when you're recruiting men for a study on penile lengthening, it's not like you can go out on Google and advertise for it. Right. So, you know, Google and, and Facebook and all those things, um, block those type of advertisements. Hmm. Um, and, and so, and, you know, you don't want that cookie following you around the internet either. So, right. so we, we had to look for sort of creative ways. Um, and so we actually got a fair number of patients by putting it in clinicaltrials.gov, which is the NIH website. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I said, well, you know, why don't I put an advertisement in the gay newspapers in San Francisco? And so we spent a fair amount of money putting this in the advertisement section of the gay newspapers in San Francisco. Uh, and lo and behold, we, we didn't get that many patients. Um, and so then I was like, well, you know, what's next? So I was at that time, I was uh, a sexual wellness advisor for Pornhub. Um, you know, all clothes on type stuff, but you just like good, solid information. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's like a like a sexual wellness site on Pornhub. And so I decided to advertise on Pornhub and. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of jackpot. Well, no, it actually <laughs> wasn't. But, no, it wasn't. But, you know, it's kind of funny because you sit there with the consultant and they're like, well, you know, what keywords do you want? I'm like, well, OK, big penis, little penis, big cock, little cock, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and, but sadly, we didn't get that many people from uh, Pornhub either. And so then I'm like, oh, what do we do? So I'm like, all right, what about Grinder? So we started uh, putting digital advertisements on Grindr. That didn't work. So then I went to swingers websites. That didn't work. Oh, man. You're persistent, yeah. though. I'm a, I'm a persistent son of a bitch. So, <laughs> so finally, there's actually a, a, a urologist at University of Maryland uh, named Rena Malik. And she makes very high quality YouTube videos. Uh, and she's got over a million followers and her video on penile augmentation got over 25 million hits views. Wow. Uh, and so I contacted her kind of out of the blue and I explained the situation. I explained who I was and so on and so forth. And so she was gracious enough to put it into her community portal thing on YouTube. And sure enough, all of a sudden it started raining uh, men, men. Were, yeah, it started raining men. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and, uh, and we were able to finish up the study. So nice. I'm, I'm eternally grateful to Rena Malik and I put her on the, on the study. So that's, that's sort of the, the story about how we got the, the P long study finally completed. That's amazing. 
Man, yeah, you got you got so much humor in how you share this stuff. I love I love how you just you know the way that you speak about it is very welcoming and it's it's very you know it makes it easy for people to have conversations. So I just imagine that you know you have this ability to really put men at ease when you're having these conversations. Well, I mean, if you can't laugh at the kind of stuff that I do, <laughs> you no, know, you can't laugh at anything. Oh, that's no, brilliant, man. I love it. David? Doc, Doc, thank you so much, man. Always a pleasure hanging out with hey, you. Hey, my pleasure. I appreciate my the pleasure. information and your wisdom and, and all the above, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I love uh, I love being here, so I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, it won't be the last time. Take care, Doc. Got it. All right. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.